Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're very happy that you're here. We're gonna take a couple of minutes to allow everyone who has signed up for today's uh, webinar to join us. My name is Melissa Bache. I'm the Director of International Student Recruitment at Coach University, and I'm very, very honored to be hosting today Assistant Professor Dr. Jem Vezirolu, who is a professor of commercial law at Koch University School of Law. He's also an affiliated scholar at the UNESCO Chair on Gender Equality and Sustainable Development, which is a very important undertaking of our university. We have invited Dr. Vesirolo to provide us with a, a taste, a sample lecture of uh, one of the courses that he teaches, which is related to ESG and sustainability in corporate law. This is for uh, people who are interested in the topic, have started to learn about it or have no, has no idea about this and would like to know more so that you can get a taste of the type of topics that are being discussed in our law school at the moment and in the future. Professor Vesirolu has a very, very impressive CV, I have to say. He joined Coach University almost uh, eight years ago, and he had completed his doctoral degree at Istanbul University. And before that, he completed his LLM degree at Oxford University. And he was a graduate or his LL LLB degree from Galatasaray University. He has delivered, uh, for example, very recently, summer courses at Yale University and also at King's College in the UK related to the topics of ESG and sustainability. So what we're going to do today is that Professor Vesirolo is going to deliver his lecture. Then we're going to have a very short amount of time for questions from participants after his lecture. And then if uh, then he needs to go because he has a lot of commitments, of course. But if after that you have any questions regarding the law school program, specifically our LLM program or even PhD in law program, we will be happy to answer those questions. I also have here our executive director from the School of Law, she's a bit under the weather, so um, get me also. I hope you recover, but in case of any technical, very detailed questions, she's also here to help us. So without further ado, I want to invite Dr. Vesirolu to open his microphone and introduce himself very briefly and start the lecture, which is what we're all here for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, well, I'm teaching corporate law and business law uh, courses uh, at Koch University. So uh, today we will focus uh, on ESG and sustainability in corporate law. So in the ever-evolving landscape of corporate law, uh, our focus today extends beyond conventional structures into the realm of environmental, social, and governance factors, collectively known as the ESG. So welcome to this uh, lecture titled ESG and Sustainability in Corporate Law. So the ESG can be seen as a transform transformative power in shaping business impact uh, on our environment and society. Well, uh, over the next 30 minutes, uh, we will dissect the symbiotic relationship between companies and sustainability. So our exploration today uh, will navigate through uh, the legal intricacies, uh, emerging trends, and the imperative for businesses to integrate sustainability into their DNA. So let's delve into the dynamic landscape of ESG now. Uh, and we will put a special emphasis on climate crisis. So first, we will uh, see the conceptual framework, the background and context of sustainability and risks and opportunities for companies. So as it's a taste lecture, we will only cover the introduction part today. Uh, so let's look at uh, what are these. Let's start with the conceptual framework. So some of you may already be familiar with the first slides. Uh, so it will be a recap for you, but allow us to contextualize the topic. So sustainability, as it is used today, uh, it is traced back to the Club of Rome. Uh, they are in their reports date, dated 1972, entitled The Limits to Growth. So right after we have this uh, United Nations 8 Millennium Development Goals, uh, these were applicable between the period between uh, 2000 and 2015. And one of these goals was the ensuring environmental sustainability. But right after, the SDGs, as you may have heard uh, them, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these are the current goals globally. And uh, which of 
we have these seven, 17 of these development goals. And which of these goals are most related to, you, to the climate crisis, do you think? So just have a look at them. Maybe you haven't uh, seen these goals for maybe five to six seconds. We have at number 13, climate action. But you will see that many of them, maybe more than four or five of them, are related to climate crisis that we are faced today. So let's look at sustainability and ESG uh, as two different concepts now. Sustainability is understood and defined in a wider way, but these two concepts are interchangeable. And it depends on the context, uh, which of them uh, is used. For example, you can uh, use ESG when you talk about ESG compliance, ESG investment criteria, risk and opportunities, and commitments. So generally, we are using ESG in a uh, business context. But sustainability uh, have, has three main pillars, so environmental, social, and governance. So ESG is um, collective meaning for them. So let's focus on the environmental and more specifically climate change part. Now we are looking at the international legal framework that addresses the climate change in order to contextualize our topic. So the first important development was United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, uh, concluded in 1992. Uh, today, there are 198 signatories. And then the foremost, the most significant developments uh, was the Paris Agreement signed in 2015 at COP21. By the way, you may have heard COP as well. For example, tomorrow, uh, COP28 will be held in Dubai. So it is an abbreviation for Conference of the Parties. So it is execu executive part, executive body of the UNFCCC. So in Paris agreements, the states undertook to limit global warming well below two Celsius degree from the pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to keep at, uh, keep it at 1.5 by um, 2100. And it means we will be carbon, hopefully, we will be carbon neutral by um, 2050. And then we have the UN. Uh, they announced, the UN has announced the Green Deal and the UN is today in the forefront of the ESG movement. Um, in this Green Deal, the EU announced that it will be net zero in terms of greenhouse gas by 2050. And on top of that, it will decrease emissions by 55% by 2030. So then we look at COP26 and 27, uh, we can observe that there's a consensus on this more ambitious limit of 1.5 Celsius degree. And UNFCC and the Paris Agreement is very important because more than 90% of the world's economy is now signed up to net zero targets. But when we focus on these two last two COPs, we, we call them business and finance COP because before that we were assigning the task to protect the environment to states. But now we understood that uh, we should also assign uh, this duty to companies, to private sector, to private capital. That's why uh, one of the most important agenda of these two COPs were focusing on climate finance, climate disclosures, transition plans, and greenwashing concerns. So let me uh, ask you, are we on track to limit the increase to 1.5 by um, 2100. So here I have both good and bad news. When we look at the International Agency, uh, Energy Agency's report in uh, 2021, all the climate pledges to date, if met in full and on time, would hold the rising global temperatures to 1.8 by uh, 2100. However, the lack of firm plans for, I mean, short-term plans 
uh, means the actual increase could be 2.4. So World Economic Forum has an equivalent report. And then this is one of the most pre prestigious report, the IPCC's report. And it says global warming will already hit 1.5 by 2040, uh, even in the best case scenario. And it could happen in less than 10 years. It means uh, 2032, so right after the current SDGs are over. So now let's talk about some good news. Anyways, we are on progress since the Paris Agreement in terms of the temperature increases. So let's look at it. So if there was no Paris Agreement, the world was heading for three to four Celsius degree of warming, but it is also bad news when we translate it to its uh, consequences because at 1.5, 70% of the world's coral reefs die. And at two degrees, they all die and more than 1 million people, billion people, sorry, uh, could be affected by fatal heat and humidity. So what is next here? So we will, it's better to keep the bar high, which means 1.5 and fall short, maybe 1.6, uh, sorry, eight, then to readjust the bar to 1.8 and fall even shorter, maybe 2.5 or more. So delivering on global climate goals at the necessary scale requires a large step up in financing from private sources and governments need to enact ambitious policies that would leverage the private capital required to effectively address the climate crisis. So at COP15, developed nations committed to providing um, 100 billion US dollars annually in climate finance for developing countries by 2020, but it failed. And it was extended to 2025, but now it, again, it is expected to fail. And it is understood today that at least four to six trillion dollars per year in, in low carbon and climate resilient measures are needed to meet Paris objectives. But again, uh, then we look at the aesthetics, uh, it's not happening. So don't worry, I won't let you drown in numbers and graphs, but uh, I'm just putting this graph to visualize and have a better grasp of the current situation. So there's a steady increase in private uh, capital uh, channel through the, the, for climate crisis, but it is not sufficient at all. So far, we have understood the urgency of the current situation and that we need an effective and efficient regulatory framework. So it's a top-down approach. But surprisingly, the market is beyond the law in certain areas. So there has been a marked shift from top-down reliance on governments to bottom-up action by businesses, investors, and GOs, and, co and consumers really. So today, no matter which company executive you ask, they will say this, companies need to integrate climate concerns into their decision-making processes. Why do you think is there such an acceptance adopted by all company managers? Or which actors are putting pressure upon companies? I can provide a classification here, a list here. So on one hand side, we have public investor pressure. So I'm mentioning actually capital markets here, equity markets. As a second, uh, we have sustainable finance coming from banks or lenders. So this is this may be also called debt markets. And third, companies has to manage their risks, minimize their risks and their physical, transitional and reputational risks. So we will see these uh, subclasses of risks for companies. And then we all know that uh, companies and all kinds of uh, business organizations are using this ESG matter issue to manage their brand reputation. So they want to expand their brand reputation uh, by leveraging sustainability and ESG factors into their uh, decision, corporate decisions. So let's look at the uh, public investor pressure now. So who are these? They might be retail investors, I mean individual investors. And even if they're largely retail investors, 
they can behave collectively. For example, there is a, a platform called Climate Action uh, 100 Plus. It's a coalition of investors with more than uh, 68 trillion US dollars in attend, I mean, under their management, and they focus on large emitters. So far, uh, there are approximately 170 uh, companies. They focus on these companies, their current list, and uh, the initiative is already updating its focus list. So they are putting pressure upon these companies. So on one hand side, we have retail investors, and on the other hand side, we have institutional investors. So these are hedge funds, private equities, insurance companies, pension funds, index funds, and they can also act collectively. There are some platforms for themselves as well. The Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change or the Investor Agenda are uh, two of them. So when we look at the NASDAQ two, uh, 2023 ESG survey, uh, we can understand that regulators and investors have the most influence over ESG strategy when it is asked to managers of listed companies in the US. So regulation comes first, of course, but they name investors as the largest, second largest uh, pressure. So here uh, we can see sustainable funds asset size. Uh, this is a great uh, graph showing sustainable fund assets. So it has touched it touched um, $4 trillion in the third quarter of uh, 2021. But what about 2022 and 2023? The graph is not going steady up because there has been an anti-ESG movement by the Republic, especially the Republicans in the US. And there are some greenwashing concerns and regulatory uncertainty related to this greenwashing in the EU. So that's why um, the taxonomies, the classification of sustainable investments change or um, strict regulations about addressing the greenwashing concerns are coming. That's why private sector has a little bit uh, slowed down in the last two years. So let's focus on these public investors a little bit. Uh, we know that there is already a growing appetite and a shift to green investments. But why do they behave like this? When you look at the individual investors, they might have some financial implications. I mean, they, they might look to financial implications of the climate-related risks, which I mentioned, physical risks, transitional risks, or reputational risks. So they can see some challenges or opportunities. They, they uh, use this kind of factors to price the shares of the companies or they might have some long-term and sustainable value creation purposes. It can happen. On the other hand side, we have this uh, institutional investors. And when we look at their motivation, uh, first of all, there are some investor stewardship policies, which means that uh, the jurisdictions like the EU or the UK or Japan are trying to facilitate the use of shareholding rights and to enable their collective action vis-a-vis -vis the corporate managers. So there are some specific legislations for uh, shareholders in listed companies to use their power within the company against the board of directors. And second, asset managers have their own commitments to their uh, customers. And some funds, like index funds, have to mitigate their systemic risk because they are exposed to the whole economy. So how do they use their voice? First, they invest in greener assets and greener assets price goes up, the valuation of the company goes up and the director's remuneration or executive compensation goes up. Or they can use the uh, threat of exits so they can leverage their ability to exit the company to influence the direction of the firm. And uh, for instance, the hedge fund engine number one ran a successful campaign to gain multiple board seats with support from institutional investors at US fossil fuel giant Exxon, Exxon Mobil. Uh, 
here I talked about investor stewardship, but it enables these shareholders to use their voice to ensure better governance practices. They might vote down a policy, they might uh, remove um, incumbent director to follow good governance. Uh, and sometimes they can even act collectively. For example, the Global Investor Statement to Governments on Climate Crisis, it's an open letter. And it is one of the most ambitious actions called for, and it includes mandated climate transition plans for investors. So it forces listed companies to make pledges, binding pledges about climate crisis. So maybe we can here uh, discuss which one is better, the threat of exit or using the voice within the company. It is a discussion, I mean, it's a debated issue, it's a hotly debated issue. And sometimes it might not be possible for certain investors to exit the company. When we look at the closed companies, I mean, unlisted companies, not listed companies, you may not have a chance to exit the company. Or sometimes uh, some funds, they have to uh, multiply their portfolio and they cannot exit from certain companies. So it is. it may not be possible sometime. And voice is more likely to bring about socially desirable results than exit. Because investors, new investors after their exit, new investors with much less interested in the ESG impact of the company uh, can replace those exiting due to climate concerns. And it is it has been happening. So uh, from these three needs from uh, Financial Times, I guess, yeah, it is saying hedge funds cash in as green investors dump energy stocks. And there are lots of examples about this. Uh, maybe we can talk about here as this about this specific example. Uh, more specific one is the involvement of private equity the last uh, line, in the North Sea Basin oil and gas production, which reportedly jumped to 10% in 2020 from virtually zero five years earlier. So private equity boom is also related to this uh, climate crisis related regulations and pressures. But I talked about you the uh, reactions in the US, for example, um, there has been some take private proposals to gain more freedom. And we have a significant example of continental resources in the US. It was, it has been a, it had been a, a listed company until last year, and it was bought out by the controlling shareholder and the manager of the company. And according to the SEC filing of this um, tender process, it's, says positioning ourselves as a private company will allow us to take maximum advantage of our greatest strengths, our strong heritage as one of the leading exploration companies in the world. So sometimes listed companies are trying to uh, lower the pressure, the investor's pressure by way of taking private proposals, by way of delisting the companies from the stock exchange and becoming a closed company. Let me just skip these ones. So the first pressure was coming from the public investor. The second one is coming from the banks or lenders. Uh, we call it, we call this uh, influence sustainable finance. So what is sustainable finance? Banks provide you better interest rates or uh, there is a facilitated access to finance. If you consume that money, if you employ that money, that fund for ESG uh, comply decisions or activities. For example, we have green bonds. These bonds are, uh, I mean, the bonds whose proceeds are earmarked for funding climate-friendly projects are called green bonds. So who are giving these kind of bonds? Uh, we have EVRD, European uh, Bank, uh, EBR is the biggest uh, provider, largest provider. In Germany, number one, it was 
Cafe W, ING in Netherlands, or Standard Chartered in the UK. So these were these have, have been among the largest providers of uh, sustainable finance. So why do they give this kind of finance then? I mean, why do they facilitate finance if it is given for green bonds or a green loan? Because they also have their own alliances, own promises to themselves. One of them is the net zero banking alliance. So 40% of global banking assets is signatory of this alliance, part of this alliance. Uh, so they also have, these banks, also have accountability to their own investors, own clients. That's why they are behaving uh, within this direction. And when it is easier to access finance uh, for sustainable or green finance uh, instruments, then the companies tries, try to increase their ESG score to reach to the criteria set by the banks. So there's a little bit problem here because stand, I mean, I'm saying standards. I mean, there, there, there are some sustainable finance standards in the sector, but uh, there is actually a lack of standards. So the EU uh, or International Capital Market Association are trying to set and establish uh, unified standards for um, global sustainable finance industry. So these graphs are showing euro area issues of green debt securities. Uh, Melissa, how many minutes do I have? You have five minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so number one is shared from, from year to year by Germany and France. So it's an issue of green, green debt securities by country. So let's get to the uh, number three in our lists. I mean, the first one was public investors. The second one was sustainable finance, which means a uh, debt markets uh, led by the banks. Now we have uh, the risk management of the companies as the pressure number three. So we have physical risks like natural disasters. There can, there can be some fire, flood in the uh, manufacturing sites, or there might be some water scarcity near uh, your site or difficulties in accessing the certain raw materials or the rise of energy costs might uh, might affect your costs. So these are called physical risks. But there might also be transitional risks. For example, net zero regulatory compliance in Turkey, for example, and in the EU. Uh, the regulations related to sustainability are really dynamic and you have to catch up with uh, these regulations in order to comply with them. And if you lose the grip, then you might end up with some administrative fines. For example, uh, we, in the EU, there is this uh, CS3D, uh, Corporate Supply Chain Due Diligence Directive. Uh, it, it has not been entered into force, but Germany, Netherlands, the UK, uh, and France have their own supply chain acts, and one of them is Germany Liefergesetz, and Germany is our is, is Turkey's uh, largest uh, trade partner. So Turkish companies are actually indirectly affected by this Liefergesetz in Germany, and they have to modify their supply supply contracts. If they don't modify, amend these contracts, then the managers and both the company as well uh, may be held liable for human rights violation or um, a pollution of, uh, of the relevant site. So this one uh, was one of the most important uh, parts of transitional risks. And keeping pace with new technologies. So environmental friendly new technologies have to be uh, used have to be used by uh, businesses. If you lose the grip at this part, again, you will um, experience some disadvantages here as well. Then there is this change of consumer behavior. Uh, it says it might be classified under the reputational risk, but uh, you would lose money if you don't uh, catch up with the new trends, if you don't 
decarbonize your products, your organization, then you might have to end up with uh, consumer backlash. Then we have these reputational risks. So when we look at the actors at, uh, within the realm of reputational risks, we have the employees, consumers, suppliers, the media, activist NGOs, which are the uh, most, which are the strongest uh, actors in climate disputes, climate litigation, and then we have the financiers. Uh, I will just give you an example about the employees' backlash, and I will end up here our taste lecture. So in uh, 2019, we saw a protest of Amazon, Google, and other tech employees, and they uh, protest in support of climate action. So what happens right after this uh, climate action protest, Google launched a program for green startups as employees revolt or with record on climate change. And again, Google announced a new climate change pledge. I mean, it's uh, about fully switching to renewables by 2030. And it was one of the demands of the employees open letter and uh, placed in the open letter. And when you look at Amazon, it's made a climate pledge committing to net zero by 2040. It's an ambitious one. If you look at uh, micro targets, not macro targets of countries or regions, but when you look at the targets or pledges of companies, it's an ambitious one. And it's also undertook to fully, to switch to fully renewable energy by 2030. Sometimes, they are not on the streets, but they use their pressure pressure within the company. So we call it an act, workplace activism. So when we look at a survey, four out of five companies expect an unprecedented rise in workplace activism over the next three to five years. It's it was a, a survey from uh, twenty three, uh, sorry twenty twenty, and they might also influence shareholder resolutions in the general assembly meetings. So right before the general assembly meetings, uh, they put pressure on specific, I mean, strong uh, minority shareholders to change the shareholder resolutions in the GA, general assembly meetings. Uh, but this one was unsuccessful, uh, dating, dated uh, 2022. And sometimes they use open letters for managers to put pressure uh, publicly. So I might continue, but I want to use my uh, time effectively here. So. Uh, this course also covers uh, the pressures of employees, consumers, financiers upon companies, and then it looks and navigates through the ESG-related regulations. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Professor Vesirolu, for sharing your insights. It's, it's a great introduction to the framework and key concepts and the most recent kind of developments in terms of the stakeholders. Um, for those of you who may be interested in uh, going a bit deeper, Professor Vesirolu has very generously shared on his linked profile um, a slide version of the course that he delivered this summer at King's College London um, uh, Poon, the Poon Dickin, Dickin, I, I can never get the name right. I'm sorry. Poon Dickinson Law School, yeah. Poon Dickinson <laughs> Law School, or King's um, College. So it's available in his uh, LinkedIn profile. I highly recommend that you follow him because if you're interested in the topic, it's also a very good way to keep up to date with, with what's happening and events in the in the sector. So if there's any questions for Professor Vesirolu, I kindly ask you to uh type those questions in the Q&A box when you tap on your screen or on the chat section. Um, we'll have a couple of minutes to wait to receive your questions. If not, of course, you're more than welcome to uh, send those questions to us later on. And we also have time to answer questions about the Coach University Law School and specifically about our LLM in private law and LLM in public law programs in terms of the admission uh, requirements and the process for the 2024 intake. So we're very excited about starting to meet future LLM students who may be participating today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to um, type those. You will also receive the recording of this 
session via email after um, after, uh, by tomorrow. Oh, okay. So thank you, Gunhan. Uh, let me open the chat so that you can all use it. Let me open that. Okay, so I think now people can also use the chat, but if uh, you can also use the Q&A uh, feature on the screen. I'll double check here. So Gunhan is saying thank you for this presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you're muted, uh, Doctor Israel. You're you're welcome, Ms. Gunhan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Check in here. Okay. So, um, if there are no other questions, I want to um give back time to Professor Vecinolo because I know he's about to join another uh, commitment, another meeting. So I want to thank you so much again for this and for your time and and all of the best and all of the, the work that you're doing on this very, very, very important topic for everyone <laughs> on Earth, basically, and, and how do we rein in corporations <laughs> through law. Thank you very much, Mason, for giving this opportunity to uh, meet the uh, LM candidates. Uh, have you. a nice evening. Meeting to thank you. All. Also from Marion, she's saying thank you for the lecture and the professor's name. So, so if there's no other questions, then we're gonna sign off and end today's webinar with that. Okay. So if there's no other questions, then we will do that. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a great uh morning or uh, day or evening, depending on where you are. I know there's people joining in from very different places. I see Sarah. Uh thank you. Thank you for joining Sarah as well. Okay. Bye, everyone.